Thank you and welcome from my side too. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Project Work for uh, accepting the invitation. And also for this valuable uh, uh, nice award for the uh, I would like to uh, slightly introduce uh, Professor Richard Project Work. So he did his PhD from uh, DRBE, one of the famous institutes in India. And then he was, uh, uh, he was motivated to go to France, I, I would say. And then he did his postdoctoral uh, research over there. And then I think he also had a small stint in industry, uh, what I see from his CV. And then he was uh, awarded this prestigious ORIS uh, fellowship in the USA, and then he went there. Um, later on, he was also, I think he came back to France. He liked France so much that he couldn't resist. So he came back from the US to France. And interestingly, he started his independent career uh, in one of the very popular institutes in Saudi Arabia, KAUST, probably you must have uh, heard, which is a well known uh, institute for catalysis. And then later on, um, he went on to join uh, one of the very popular, I would say, uh, institute in India, Kata uh, Research Institute. Um, there he started as a reader and slowly he climbed up uh, the ladder as associate professor and presently he's a full professor over there. And uh, I would have to really tell he, is, he has won so many awards and there's a long list, but I wouldn't uh, go through uh, all the lists. But I would also say there are some interesting awards and he was also, uh, as I said already, Orais is already uh, one of the, the biggest award. And then he was also a uh, Asian Rising Fellow. And also he was, uh, yeah. 15 Asian Chemical Congress Singapore. He was had this uh, particular award, I guess. And then in India, he is very popular. As I said, he has, he has numerous awards. Every year he's getting awards, so I wouldn't mention everything. But what I would say is that very interestingly, he got, as I said already, Falling uh, Walls Award, which is very nice. So a, he's a rising star. And I just wanted to tell you what exactly he works on. I think his uh, research is uh, dedicated towards uh, um, nanocatalysis, and especially he likes this climate change issues. Uh, I realized from his papers that he really working on that uh, very diligently. And um, I think is also the aim is to shape up the morphologies of the nanostructure and to try to see how these nanostructures or the morphologies are can be tuned and how they can be for catalysis. I think he, at the moment, he is, of course, developing protocols for many, many different catalytic reactions, especially photocatalysis. And probably he also will speak today about CO2 transformation as well via a solar energy. And also, uh, probably he also maybe delve into uh, some of the important reactions, CH activation, CC coupling, and uh, metathesis, and also hydrogenation reactions. So as I said, his research area is very broad and he really works on tuning the nano catalyst for such applications. So with this, I would like to invite uh, Professor Prashant Tiwar to the very talk. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, so kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, the development of uh, plasmonic black gold, uh, which allows the band of the solar light and then that generates the uh, excited electrons, we call them hot electrons, which you can inject into the CO2, make the CO2 very reactive and then convert CO2 to use useful chemicals. That's the summary of my talk. So why we are trying to convert CO2, I guess we all know. The climate change is one of the most serious problems that mankind has ever faced. And uh, one of the best way, the potentially best way to solve the climate change is if we can achieve this circular carbon, carbon economy. Which is the pointer? Do you have a pointer? Or I use the... Your computer. Just as your computer. Okay. But I don't see my... Okay. Yeah. So, so idea is that you convert CO2, you take the CO2, develop some sort of a catalytic system which works with the solar side, convert CO2 into useful chemicals, you use them, you burn them, you get the energy into the work and, and send that, uh, produce CO2 back to the catalyst, right? Achieve this 
uh, circular carbon economy. However, we all know that CO2 is extremely stable molecule, right? So why will CO2 convert into anything? It will remain stable. And if I want to convert CO2 into uh, by reacting with hydrogen or any other you know, reactants and convert into useful product, you need to overcome such a huge activation energy barrier. And that makes the process unsustainable. So the, the idea that we are trying to do is, can we develop a catalytic material which will reduce this activation energy barrier? So the idea is you have a high surface area nanomaterials and the CO2 get activated, right? The bonds, the two oxygens will interact with this active surface. The bonds will get stretched, bent, and that will make CO2 very active. That will reduce the activation energy barrier. And then additional energy that is required should come from the sunlight. So that makes the entire process sustainable. And that's what, that's what we're trying to achieve. So what are our way of designing these catalytic materials? So we work on a heterogeneous catalyst. So that means it's a two-component system. You have a high surface area material which acts as a support, right? And then you have different active sites. Active sites could be middle nanoparticles, some organic molecules, uh, based on the reaction that you're looking for. So we in our lab have developed this uh, new material called dendritic fibrous nanosilica. It's a silica uh, with a nanoparticle size from uh, you know 50 uh, to uh, 100 nanometers, so you can make silica with a 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200. So based on the, the requirement, there's a huge surface area, 500 to 1200 meters per gram. And 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 in addition to the high uh, good textural property, you can see it has excellent thermal and mechanical stability. That means I can use these materials for high temperature and high pressure reactions. And uniqueness is the, the fibrous morphology. Right? Most of the high surface area material look, look at MOF or SB50 or MC41. Those are all pores. You have one entry and one exit, which has an issue with, uh, in terms of the diffusion of the rate and R product. Here, it's just more like an open structure. It's like a marigold flower. So that means reactant can diffuse in from different different positions, and product can diffuse out, right? And that makes the, the process very sustainable. And then it's easy to synthesize, right? And we were able to even upscale this from milligram to now up to 100 gram scale. So these are some of the images of the, uh, the reactant, as you can see, uh, I think one of these first uh, and, and you see those those fibrous structures. And another uniqueness that you can see here is the pore size distribution. You have pores. Now the definition of pore here is not really a typical pore. I mentioned pore, but it's more like a distance between the fibers, right? So you consider this as a flower and made up of a petals. So the distance between the petals. So you can imagine the the distance at the center of the sphere will be less, and then they they are moving that direction. So and then you will. Uh, Bigger pores as when you move towards the, the periphery of the atmosphere. And that's what you see here around 5 nanometer, and you can go up to 25 nanometer and even more. Yeah, you have macro pores also. Now, another thing uh, is if you want to really develop a new material, that is what is required if you really want to combat the, the climate change, then we need to understand why these materials are formed. Right? One can ask this question that why it is spherical, why it is fibrous, why not a flat surface, why not a solid sphere, why a particular uh, shape and morphology. And we try to, in our lab, try to understand the formation mechanism of this particular material. Now, if you look at the way we synthesize the silica, right? so this is simple organic reaction. You take this tetraethoxyacetate molecule, you hydrolyze, you get a silicic acid, and then you condense and polycondense with the silica. That's a typical silica synthesis. If I follow this protocol, you will get a bulk silica, right? The sand and the beach. However, what we wanted then control the size and the morphology, and that allow that for that you need a some sort of a template itself. So you need to create an artificial template into which the silica can flow. So we created a template using this uh, surfactant molecule. Now this is the uh, the C tab molecule. It has this quaternary nitrogen, and 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 that that entire group is a polar. We call it the polar pair, shown as a blue ball in the in the in the cartoon. And then you have this CS2 CS2 up to 16 times, which is the city, uh, which is a non-polar pair. So whenever you add such a molecule which is having a polar head and a non-polar tail, they try to form a surface. They try to form a micelles. I will show you the animation to understand this better. So view ball is the uh, uh, polar head, and that zigzag is the uh, CS2, CS2, uh, uh, cetyl uh, hydrocarbon chain of non-polar. When you added them into the solvent, which is a xylene and water, mixture of polar and non-polar, they try to form a micelles. But the concentration is such that they form these lamellar phases. And you can say that there could be repulsion between the the uh, you know the uh, quaternary nitrogen. So we added one more co surfactant which will go between these molecules, stabilizes the interfaces, and and those interfaces will allow you to grow the silica in them. And what we realize is that these are not floating flat, 
into the solvent, but they are in the form of a droplet. We call them a bicontinuous bi micro droplet because you have xylene, water, trying to mix together. So these are the droplets made up of CTAB, xylene, water, and some amount of uh, pentanol, like hexanol. And these are the template, right? And now we have a water channel into which you have a silica precursor, which will hydrolyze, condense, undergo nucleation growth, and you will have silica fibers inside those water channels. So if you keep them away, you will get a smaller nanoparticles, as small as 50 nanometer. But we also learn by simply changing some reaction conditions, you can merge them together. Right, without changing their internal structure. That's why we call use the word fractalization. That means they're merging, but still the internal structure remains the same. And then that allows you to get, get an even bigger DFNS particle, bigger nano silica particle, up to 1200 nanometer. Right. So that's the that's the silica that we're using to design different heterogeneous catalysts. As we all know, the silica is is ideally a very inactive material, right? It does do any catalysis. So you need to generate some sort of active site uh, onto the surface. To, to make it catalytically active. And another challenge with the silica is insulating material. It doesn't harvest any of these solar photons. So we want to also make the silica photoactive. So it has to be photoactive and it has to also have some catalytic side so that it can convert CO2 into useful chemicals. So how do we do that? So one of the concept is using the uh, uh, using the plus one, such as plus one resonance. I guess most of you must be knowing it, but still uh, quickly. What is surface plasma resonance is the is the dipolar excitation of entire particle between the negatively charged free electrons and positively charged uh, the center, right? If you consider a 10 nanometer gold particle, they have this uh, oscillating electron cloud, right, onto the surface. And when they see a uh, electric field of the light at one particular wavelength, there will be a resonance. And that's the and that resonance is localized onto the particles of the nickel, uh, not a nickel, the gold in this case, and it becomes localized surface plasma resonance, right? So that's LSPR. Which and now, if I take a 10 nanometer gold, say you can have you know, the resonance will be around 550 nanometers, so I can get a 550 nanometer uh, wavelength like like, like harvested by that nanoparticle. If I want to change the uh, wavelength of absorption, I can change the size of the particle and I can I can tune the tune the lambda max. <clears throat> However, more exciting thing happens when after the LSPR, once that resonance is broken, that entire energy is now damped onto the surface. Right. So whatever the energy, sun energy is now uh, absorbed by the material is damped onto the surface. And we know uh, in metallic nanoparticle, you have electrons at the, at the Fermi level, right? And then what happens? Because of that energy damping, lots of electrons undergo excitation via the S2S or E2S transition. And you form these excited electrons, which is called as hot electrons in this field. And these excited electrons, which is above Fermi level, can then be injected. Can the, these hot electrons can then be injected into the CO2, make CO2 really reactive and convert into useful chemicals. However, the challenge is the lifetime of these electrons are extremely short, right? So why will they uh, inject into something? They will try to recombine. So the, the lifetime is less than tens of percent. So that is the challenge. However, there are other relaxation processes where while these hot electrons undergo further relaxation, they undergo electron-electron collision and you form another group of hot electrons, which has a better lifetime, somewhere here up, still above Fermi level, which has a better lifetime, hundreds of tens of seconds. And those electrons, those electrons, known as the Fermi Dirac distribution of uh, hot electrons, those electrons can be injected into the CO2. I'm just giving the example of CO2. It can be any reactor molecule. I'm going to show you some other, other reactions. And then you can carry out this hot electron mediated reaction uh, uh, to convert different reactors into the product. However, if you are not also able to draw inject this hot electrons into the reactant. Then these electrons again further, further, further undergo a relaxation and they you know, have some sort of a collision with the vibrating atoms. It's called electron photon coupling. And that entire energy then uh, converted, entire photon energy is then converted into a thermal energy, which is localized onto the surface of the nanoparticle. So again, you can carry out a thermal catalysis using the light by using this photothermal, uh, photothermal behavior. So either you use the hot electron to carry out the electron media reaction, or you can use this uh, localized thermal heating, localized heating, which also allows you to do the analysis. Now the question was, how do I harvest entire broadband of the light? I cannot just harvest 550 or 560. That is not going to make your catalyst really uh, uh, efficient. So the, the challenge was, if I take say 10 nanometer gold, this is how the light absorption behavior is, around 550 nanometer. And then, then it releases. What we wanted is something like this, a broadband light absorption, so that 
every wavelength of the light coming from the sunlight we have instead. Now, when we look into the literature, we found that if you change the particle size, obviously the lambda max is changing, which is shifting from one lambda to another. It's not going to let you away the entire broadband of the light. And then there is another uh, nice concept by Al Said where they said that if you bring the nanoparticles closer, then the electron cloud of these nanoparticles start interacting with each other. That is for the plasmonic coupling. And if many nanoparticles come together, lots of these electron cloud interact, and that allows you to broaden the broaden the light absorption behavior. Still not completely broad, but this at least gives us indication that the plasmonic coupling could be the way to produce a material which can provide a broadband light absorption. Now the question is, how do we tune the distances between the particles? You can tune the size, you can tune the shape, morphology, but how do I tune the distances between the particles so that I can have a different plasmonic coupling? So uh, we came up with this idea that, okay, consider this as the silica sheet of that entire DFNS particle. For simplicity, I'm just showing one sheet. And then we loaded uh, a gold nanoparticle at, at certain distances. This is possible by the I mean functionalization. And then, the hypothesis was, in my next cycle, I will maintain a synthetic condition search that you will be below the nucleation. The concentration of the gold precursor will be below nucleation, so that there will be no more nucleation once you have the nuclei onto the first sheet. And only you will have a growth stage. So what will happen? All the gold atom that we produce in your synthetic reactor, which will go and grow the existing seed, existing gold nanoparticle. And that way you keep growing the gold nanoparticle and that will reduce the distance D between them. So that was the hypothesis. And this is possible by tuning the, uh, the reducing agent, right? If we first use a primbrohydride, we use strong reducing agent and it, you reach the nucleation stage, supersaturation very fast. Afterwards, we change the uh, gold solution to K-gold solution, the K-salt of the HAUCL4, very less reactive. And we also change the reducing agent to carbonyl so that means now you are not able to achieve the supersaturation. You will never be achieving the nucleation, but you still have the gold atom, which will go and sit onto the existing gold seed, and you will allow to uh, you that will allow you to grow the gold nanoparticle. So using this hypothesis, then we we try to develop this material where we then did a different cycle: C1, C3, C4, C6. Now you can see the gold particles are coming closer and closer, right? And at C6 they are completely connected. In plasmonic coupling, you don't want the nanoparticle to connect. They should be about, apart from each other, at least uh, one nanometer or two nanometers, so that they will be coupling. Otherwise, if they connect, it's like another particle. It's not the same nanoparticle. There will be no coupling. So we were not knowing what is the optimum distance required to have that, that coupling. So that's why we made a range of materials, C1, C3, and you can see they're going through the closer. And when we characterize them for the light absorption behavior, you can see now uh, a very weak light absorption when you put a 10 nanometer particle onto the onto the DFNS and with with decrease in the gaps between the nanoparticles, the C1, C3, you see a broadband light absorption. You, you achieve complete broadband light absorption from 400 nanometer to up to 1100 nanometer. And that also changes the color of the gold. Now gold becomes black. So it's still a metallic gold, no change in the oxidation stage, there's no, no functionalization, no habitation. It's still metallic gold, but black in color because of the surface plasma coupling, as well as obviously there is a, a particle size distribution. And now you, you are able to make a black hole, which has broadband light absorption. So looking at this data, we were very excited. We said, okay, now we got a material which harvests entire solar spectrum. So it should show good catalytic activity, photocatalytic activity. So we tested this for a simple reaction, CO2 plus water uh, to give you methane, a photocatalytic CO2 methanation. And now you see this DPC4, which is a black hole, which gives you around 1.5 micromole per gram of the methane yield, which is Maybe 10 times better if I use a 10 nanometer gold particle. So clearly indicating that the plasmonic coupling does play the role and you can increase the catalytic activity. However, if you look at this again, look at the y-axis unit, it's micromole per gram. So 1.5 micromole per gram is really poor number. Even if it's better than what is recorded in the literature, it's a poor number. Then the question we ask is why the yield is low when we have a material which can harvest the entire broadband line why the activity is low. And the reason why what we thought about is it's not about only harvesting the solar photon, but it's also about the lifetime of the hot electrons, right? Once you generate these excited electrons, they need to get injected into the reactor rather than recombining. And it looks like the electrons are recombining with the hole and you're not able to transfer the electrons. So now the question is how to increase the lifetime of these electrons. 
And we came up with the idea that, okay, this is the gold, say blue color part is the gold. You generate the, uh, the electrons here, hot electrons, and then you add another nanoparticle connected to the gold, which has a, a, a empty orbitals, empty states. Say in this case, we choose nickel because nickel is known as a good catalyst for a thermal CO2 reduction. That's how we chose nickel. So you have gold, you generated the hot electrons in gold, and then you have nickel here, which has unoccupied uh, states. So the electron will jump to the nickel now. So the electron is in nickel state and coal is in gold now. So that is, it created some sort of a, a petro junction and separates the electron hole. And then possibly you can use those, those electrons as well as coal for, for CO2 reduction. So that was the hypothesis. In order to study this, we uh, prepared such a material. We took the black gold, loaded with a nickel nanoparticle, which went onto the surface of the gold as well as between the caps of the gold nanoparticle. Then we have these hot spots. And then uh, we try to evaluate them for CO2 reduction reactions. So synthesis was uh, straightforward. You make a black gold, load with a nickel nitride salt, reduced by the sodium borohydride. We also uh, did one more reduction during the catalysis by using the hydrogen gas to avoid any oxidation of the nickel. First, we wanted to see how the nickel nanoparticles are, what is their size, how they are dispersed, and we did the same images. It's difficult to see where is gold and where is nickel because their zinc contrast is so close that you can't really image nickel sitting on the gold. However, when we did the elemental mapping during the same years, you can clearly see that nickel is, is nicely uh, distributed across the sphere, right? And you can see gold and nickels are, are very close with each other. So indicating that there is a nickel onto the black gold. We then try to characterize them for uh, some of the basic uh, uh, properties like light absorption behavior, remains nearly the same even after nickel loading. We also wanted to know the oxidation state of the nickel. And you can see if you, I look at the XPS and as well as these yield studies, it says nickel is in plus two. Whereas we reduce uh, two times by so sodium hydride and then by H2 reduction. So it cannot be plus two. But the problem with both these techniques are they, when we do them, you get exposed, the sample get exposed, like uh, whenever you do the conventional XPS or conventional yields. So then we did this in situ CO titration, which allows you to do it in a glow box, in a inner atmosphere. And these two signals indicate that it is the nickel zero uh, based on the how the CO binds. Obviously, there is some, some amount of uh, nickel two plus, but 90% uh, of it is nickel zero. Another interesting thing that happens in the post-burning material is the polarizing electric field. Right, because of the surface plasma resonance, we provide, we produce huge polarizing electric field around these nanoparticles. And look at this particular field, this is around 824 volt per meter. And now imagine if your CO2 or any reactant is in that hot spot, that electrical hot spot, that what will happen? That polarizing electric field will bend the CO2 molecule, stretch the CO2 molecule. And that allows you to reduce the activation energy mm -hmm. get further. So that's the additional benefit of using the plasma material. Over the, over the semiconducting material. So based on these basic characterization, then we went ahead and carry out the CO2 reduction reaction, CO2 plus hydrogen using the solar light. You get CO, methane, and water as a byproduct. It's a flow reactor. Uh, we use a xenon lab, which has a spectrum very close to the sunlight, and you can have some filter, and you have a micro GC connected online to monitor the products. So this is where we keep the, uh, we keep our catalyst, and the light is coming from the top, gas goes in, interact with the catalyst under exposure of the light, and the product is then monitored by GC as well as the liquid product is monitored by, by the NMR. So the first thing that we did is we tried to understand the effect of light intensity on the on the productivity of the of the uh, and, and what we see is with increasing the light intensity from say uh, zero to three watt per centimeter square, you see increase in the in the productivity. Uh, of CO and uh, CO8 uh, productivity of CO. Now, when you look at this particular number, say 2.77 back per centimeter square in light, L is light and D is dark. Look at the number here 2500 millimole per gram per hour. So it was 1.75 micromole per gram per hour. And suddenly it changes to, it's a dramatic change, not only number, but the unit, now micromole to millimole by simply tuning the catalyst design. So that means Electrons were recombining, which we, we you were able to resolve by creating some sort of this uh, black gold nickel system. Another interesting thing is, uh, in terms of selectivity, also it is good. You have a, a, a more than 95% selectivity towards the CO and some very small amount of methane. 
It is very strange the result, by the way. Nickel generally gives you methane and not the CO, but here it's giving you CO because the electric field plays the role in, in desorption of the reactant, right? It's all the selectivity is all about how the intermediate desorbs from the surface. And here, because of this polarizing electric field, CO is somehow desorbing, right? Rather than staying there and converting into methane. Another interesting thing is, so when you expose the black hole with light, I said the electron goes to the excited state and come back from another batch of hot electrons, and then they come uh, relaxes back and hit the vibrating atom and convert that entire energy into the heat. And that heat we measure is around uh, 223 degrees Celsius. So how we measure the heat, uh, the, the temperature, we took the thermocouple, insert it into the black hole while it is exposed under light. So that's the temperature. It's like more like a temperature of that, that powder black hole. So that temperature was 223 degrees Celsius. So when we carried out the same reaction without light in dark at 223 degrees Celsius, activity is zero. That is absolutely no activity, indicating that it is the hot electron which is which is uh, carrying out these reactions and not the heat. I will come back to this point again. We did some control experiment to, to, uh, to, just to make sure that it is only the black hole nickel. We also did this uh, labeled experiment to prove that the product that you are getting is from the CO2 and not from some impurities. Anyway, this is low. And we carried out this for, I think, 100 hours. And you look at the stability, it's extremely stable. You see some increase in the initial hours. This is because nickel is getting reduced because you're doing the CO2 hydrogen. So you have hydrogen, you have CO2 reducing agent, can convert some of those un uh, unreduced nickel into pure nickel zero. And then you see it's stable for 100 hours. The hundred hours is like minimum it is stable. When we compare this with the uh, all the reported plasmonic catalysts, as well as some of the best semiconducting catalysts, you can see it has excellent uh, CO productivity as compared to the reported one. The only challenge that one should also look into is the, the light power that we use. It's, it's nearly 20 sun, it's not one sun. Almost all the uh, report that you see, they use very high light power. And the dream is that you take your reactor outside and, and do the reaction at one sun, 100 milliwatt per centimeter square. What we're using here is a 2.7 watt per centimeter square. So that's the challenge still to be resolved. We're trying to design a new materials which allows you to do that. Although there is another way of solving this problem, which is more engineering problem, where you focus the light, the solar light, and, and get that power. So both the, we're trying to do both the things. Now I'll come back to the same question again. I said. It's the when you carry out the reaction, uh, when we carry out the reaction in the dark at the same temperature, there is no activity indicating that it is a hot electron mediated reaction. So, there is a debate in this field which says that this may not be a correct statement. So, I said to you, how did we measure the temperature by injecting the thermocouple into the black hole? That's the best way. We also use the IR camera with a similar temperature. But then the, the opposite argument is. That, that may not be the real temperature of your surface. The surface temperature could be really high, which we are not able to, to measure. And maybe because of that, the reaction is happening, right? And it's not the hot, hot electron mediated, but it's because of that localized thermal heating. Now, how do I answer this question? Because the best way we can do as experimentalists is insert the thermocouple and use our camera to get the temperature. Both, if you don't believe in those temperatures, how do we find, find out the temperature of these surfaces? So there was one technique called uh, Raman thermometry, which is about you know whenever you know whenever the surface is heated, you get a more you have a more population in the vibrational states and you get a more anti-Stokes line. So the equation which takes the uh, intensity of anti-Stokes line versus Stokes line, and the rest of the thing is constant, and you get a temperature T. So we use this technique. But the surface temperature is even lower, 150 degrees Celsius, even what we measure. So clearly, this is also not a this was one of the well uh, recognized technique, but it looks like it is also not really a quantitative technique. So that's why I use the word semi quantitative. Then now we're coming back to the same question. Then how do I answer this question? So what we did then we carry out we carried out one hypothetical experiment, assuming that our temperature measurement is not accurate and the surface temperature say thousand degrees Celsius, which is ideally impossible because thousand degrees Celsius my gold and everything will melt. But still, just to satisfy the the other side of it. We said, okay, it's 1,000 degrees Celsius, and we did try to do one of the experiment. So, so the, at this point, assuming that it's 1,000 degrees Celsius and not what we measure, which is around 223, 25 degrees Celsius. At this point, when, when light was on, hypothetically, you reached 1,000 degrees Celsius, and I switched off the light. 
and now you need some time for that thousand degrees Celsius to go to lower temperature. Right? It cannot happen magically. It will take uh, at least a minute or a two minute based on based on the environment. So what we did once is we switch off the light. Only in ten seconds we took the GC injection. Now you look. In just in ten seconds, the activity reduced from 2300 millimole per gram per hour to just 250. Right. So that that indicates that if it's just impossible to reduce that thousand degrees Celsius to say 100 degrees Celsius or something in 10 seconds, right? Because it's it's a it's a thermal conduction. You need some time to give that energy to the environment. Whereas in 10 seconds, the yield is is nearly nearly 10% uh, of the, uh, the maximum yield. So this is, I think, one of the uh, 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 good experiment to prove that there is a more role of a, a, a hot electrons rather than the rather than the thermal, localized thermal heating. To to strengthen this argument, we try to carry out a range of other experiments. So one of these is the uh, the power law exponent. So what it says is. <coughs> If it is really a, a reaction because of the hot electron, so if I add more photons onto the blackboard, I will generate more hot electrons. And if it is really the hot electron medium reaction, then the reaction kinetics should increase. The production rate should also increase in the similar way. And that's what we see here. See 1.7, uh, 1.8, 2.1. So we keep changing the, the power intensity, light intensity onto the blackboard. And you see there's a linear, a super linear relationship between the light intensity and the production rate. Which again indicate that it is the hot electron mediated reaction and not thermal reaction. We also carry out the uh, activation energy barriers in light and dark, and you can see in light it's around 0.22 eV versus in dark it's 0.68 eV. Again indicating the role of light in, in reducing the activation energy barrier. So this uh, this electron versus hot electron versus thermal is still. Uh, 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 a debatable concept and it's still difficult to uh, you know, convince some of the time, especially if you are free. So we carried out range of other catalysts, other reactions to prove this. One of this is the uh, the so the, to prove just prove that the black gold nickel can transfer the electron. It's a very basic question that we ask, and we carried out this Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus reaction, Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus, and this can only be done by the electron transfer. It cannot be done by the uh, by the heat, right? And we saw that. Uh, the black gold nickel has a better ability to transfer the electron uh, and convert Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus as compared to uh, only black gold. Again, a proof. Another one, we carried out the same reaction, Cu2 plus hydrogen, but now in presence of a quencher, an electron quencher, uh, methyl paramethylene. So, what will happen now? Your black gold nickel has this quencher. So, now uh, the electron will either go to the quencher or to the Cu2 or hydrogen. And there is a competition. And you can see now, venture is nicely, it's organic molecule nicely localized onto the surface where CO2 is a gas. So you can see as soon as I add the venture, the activity goes down. From here, without the venture, first addition, the activity goes down. And the second addition, uh, you don't get any CO2 to CO2. Because all the electrons are now going to the venture and not to the CO2. Whereas the heat remains the same. So if it is a thermal catalysis, there should have been the CO2 activity, which is not the case. We also carried out the kinetic isotope effect, and there is a theory which says that if uh, if the, the things are happening uh, at the in the uh, excited uh, potential, vibrational potential, if the reactions are going in the excited state, you will have a higher uh, KRE as compared to when you are in when you are in dark, when you are in the dark state, and that's what we clearly see. Uh, in dark, it's a nearly one, but in 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 light, it's around 1.8. Uh, which indicates again that it's electron mediated reaction and not thermal reaction. We also tried to prove the, uh, the electron transfer. We collaborated with uh, Mr. Jacinto Saw uh, for this ultrafast transfer absorption spectroscopy, which I'm not an expert, but we just wanted to show that there is a nickel, uh, there is electron transfer from gold to nickel. And this particular um, bleach indicates that electrons are moving to the, the nickel. Feeling the nickel states, and that's why there is no more excitation in the nickel, and that's why you get a, you get a bleach in there. And that's a basic understanding of this, this data. So, now in, other, in, in addition to understanding whether it's an electron mediated or thermal uh, mediated reaction, we also try to understand the molecular feature. How does the CO2 sit onto the nickel, how it, how it converts into a product? And what we observe is CO2 sits onto the nickel 
and and this was done using in situ direct study and directly dissociate into co or oxygen see there is no hydrogen required if you really want to see this particular phase co2 can directly convert into co or oxygen but and and co then dissolves and the electric field of the uh, of the plus one play a role and the co dissolves but your nickel becomes nickel oxide no more active and there the hydrogen which is again dissociated by the plus one electron or nickel that dissociated hydrogen react with this oxygen and convert that oxygen into water and you get a free nickel state back and and then another cycle of a co2 reduction can work so this is Uh, this is a typical molecular picture of how the CO2 hydrogenation is taking place on on the PC nickel. Right, so that is all about the backward nickel uh, converting CO2 into CO. So we also try to explore these materials for uh, for uh, the range of other reactions. How much time I have? Okay, another forty minutes. Okay, forty minutes of the calculus. Where do you use any of the calculus? So it's maybe uh, maybe two mm or something. Okay, yeah, it's a big size, right? Like a cg to similar similar size. So we try to explore this material for a range of other other organic other reactions other than CO2. Mm -hmm. One of which was a uh, hydrodegradation of dichromethane. You see the DCM. You can directly convert, remove those two chlorine mm -hmm. and and convert this into a methane, and and you can again see that in dark. Nothing happens up to certain temperature, whereas in light, uh, it happens even at a, at a room temperature. Another interesting reaction that we try to carry out is acetylene semi-hydrogenation. You want to convert the acetylene into ethene without going to ethene. You want to stop acetylene to ethene, ethene without going to ethene. You don't want to, so that's why you speak is what you use the semi-hydrogenation. And more interestingly, that acetylene is only two percent. And 98% is already ethene. So that means your uh, this is a industrial relevant uh, process where you have a ethene with a 2% or 5% acetylene as a contamination, and you want to only convert that 5% acetylene into ethene without touching the ethene and converting it to ethene. So we said, can we use the plasmonic uh, concept in, in in doing this reaction? So we collaborated with uh, Professor Sukuda for the the clusters. They have very unique uh, RUPT clusters. Uh, doped uh, PT doped RU clusters, and we use our black gold. We loaded the clusters onto the black gold. I mean, see, we wanted to have cluster remain as is, but as soon as we remove the the PVP, those binders, the cluster converted into nanoparticles, very small nanoparticles, which was still okay uh, for carrying out this particular reaction. And then we carried out this reaction, C2H2, that is acetylene plus hydrogen to get you ethene. And please note that this is not only the reactant. In addition to the acetylene, 98% <coughs> is ethene, right? So that's the challenge of this reaction. And you can see uh, with increasing the uh, light intensity, you got a very good number in terms of the production rate, uh, around say 200 uh, millimole per gram per hour at six factors. And huge selectivity towards the ethene and very small amount of the ethene. And when we carried out the same thing in dark. Like like the previous one, we were not able to see a good activity in dark. Obviously, here it is more than the CO2 hydrogenation, but still, if you compare the two numbers, uh, you need to give, go very high temperature to achieve the, the same activity. We again here also we try to understand thermal versus the hot electron mediated reaction. So we carried out the kinetic acid of uh, measurement, and you see here is 2.26, which is a very high number, indicating that it's a uh, it's the uh, Uh, hot electron mediated reaction. Another interesting thing that we observe is whenever we do the hydrogenation reaction, we make sure that there is no oxygen, right? Because otherwise, how can you do a hydrogenation reaction in presence of oxygen? Here in our system, we realize that there is no oxygen. My catalyst dies in 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 one or two hours. Look at this data. Uh, without the air flow, the the activity. Or one can look at the uh, the ethene. Productivity started from here, and within a within a five ten uh, within say uh, five hours, activity goes down. A dramatic decrease in the activity. However, as soon as we add the air flow during the hydrogenation, very small amount, five percent, activity comes back. Activity comes back. So, which was a very strange reason. Why will oxygen play a role in hydrogenation? So then we try to understand what could be the reason, and for that. 
uh, we carried out the in-situ FTI studies and a lot of experience studies. And what we realized is our active site is, so we thought it's uh, the blackboard onto which you have RUPG. And we thought the RUPG is your reducing site. And, and, and nothing else, that was the typical uh, our understanding. What we realized what, when we removed the, uh, the, the coating agent on these clusters, some of the RU oxidizes into RuO2, RuOx, right? O2, O3, and better. And the acetylene activation is done onto the RuOT side, O2 side, and not the RuPT. RuPT is only helping to split the hydrogen that is required to add into the acetylene. But the, the real catalysis was happening onto the RU, RuO2 side. And now, when you do the reaction, because you have the hydrogen and because you have plasmonic, S2 dissociates, convert all that RuOT, RuO2 back to RuPG. And since RuPG can only do the hydrogen dissociation, not the acetylene uh, activation, activity goes on. As soon as I put in the air, some of that RU goes back and oxidizes into RuO2, which is the active site for, for acetylene activation. And then RuPG, there are still some RuPG which will uh, dissociate the hydrogen and, and the reaction happens. So that's what we uh, try to understand by the in-situ FTIR studies and, and lots of XAS and SPS studies. Right. In uh, another five minutes, I will just touch upon some of the other work that we do in our lab. So our, my group is divided into two parts. One uh, section is, is focused on use of light to carry out this reaction. Another is use of a thermal because that's the commercially viable process still now, right? I don't know when will the the photocatalysis will really commercialize because there's issue with the, the reactor design, light focus, and all of that. Thermal is something easy to do. So one of the uh, statement I made in my talk is that silica doesn't do anything, right? It's, it's a uh, passive material. You put active sites. And most of the time, active sites are you know, these metal nanoparticles. And we all know metal nanoparticles are very reactive, but they are also very unstable. They oxidize, they sinter, and activity of the catalyst goes on. So then we ask this question, how do I make the DFN is the silica active without putting metal nanoparticles. If there's no metal nanoparticles, there's no issue of oxidation or sintering. And then we came up with the idea of creating the defects in the material. So silica is nothing but SiO, 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 right? It is a, a amorphous uh, silica chain network. So we broke this SiO bond. So if you break the bond, then you get a um, oxygen radical, you get a SI radical, you also get oxygen vacancies, right? And so the, we asked two questions, how do we generate these radicals and whether these radicals and oxygen vacancy can activate the CO2 and dissociate the hydrogen. So I'm not going into the details, but that's what we showed here in this work that yes, you can generate these uh, these uh, defects and uh, systematically and we, sh we showed that the cooperative between the radical defect and the oxygen vacancy together activate the CO2, dissociate the hydrogen and convert CO2 into methane, right, without any metal and without any, any kind of reaction, which is a purely metal-free ligand-free reaction. Only drawback was activity. If I compare the production rate of, of, the, of this process with the metal, then this is 10 times less than, than the metal. So obviously, uh, it's not sustainable. So then we, we went back to the metal, but then we said, can we use the same defect concept to stabilize the metal sites so that they won't oxidize or they won't undergo sintering? So we, we uh, then uh, extended this, this idea. We created a defect in the TiO2. Now we coated the silica, we coated the DFNS with a thin layer of a TiO2, and then we removed the oxygen from the TiO2. We have oxygen vacancies, and onto which we have a copper sites now. So you stabilize those copper sites, and that allows you to then convert CO2 to CO with an excellent uh, productivity, as well as it's stable. it was stable at least for 200 hours, indicating that this could be another strategy to make a stable catalyst. I already showed you the, the black gold work. Another uh, question that we ask is, most of the time if you see uh, literature, whenever you see plasmonic, it's all about the metal nanoparticles. But the metal nanoparticle doesn't really have a reactive surface, right? It doesn't have OH, it doesn't have amine, so it doesn't really allow you to interact uh, with lots of chemicals, lots of reactants. So we ask this question, can I make something which is still plasmonic, but has some sites onto the surface? And that's where we synthesize these uh, nickel uh, nitride nanosheets. And these are the really thin uh, uh, layered nanosheets of nickel nitride, which has an OH termination onto the surface. And this OH act as a some sort of a base, interact with CO2, concentrate the CO2 onto the nickel nitride, and then you expose with the light and you carry out a CO2 reduction reaction. It already has a nickel, so you don't need to put another nickel in, in this one. So this was another 
work where we showed that one can replace the metal nanoparticles by the by the uh, uh, nitrides, metal nitrides. In this particular work, we showed that the magnesium, we started with the magnesium nanoparticle, but then we realized even a magnesium bulb can react with water to get you methane, methanol, or mega acid hydrogen. By the way, this reaction works at a room temperature. So one can ask this question, how come? I have shown you such a huge activation energy barrier, then it's just impossible for CO2 to react at room temperature. And when we saw it, we also never believed it. But then we realized this, there are two reactions that is happening. One is CO2 plus water plus magnesium. Another is magnesium plus water to get you magnesium hydroxide, which is an exothermic reaction. So energy release in that reaction is used by the CO2 reaction. So at the end, you don't need to give any energy. But uh, within the reaction uh, vessel itself, the, there is a energy transfer. And this is something now, it is so simple. It's just a mixing. And you, you, can, you solve the problem of CO2 uh, as well as the waste magnesium. We also showed that one can use the waste magnesium. So this is something we are trying to uh, scale and commercialize uh, with other industries. This is another work where we showed that we can create a solid acids. You know, most of the time solid acids are zeolites. They are extremely strong. But zeolites problem is the, the microporosity, right? So not all the bigger molecule can diffuse in. So we asked this question, can we make a solid acid which has a which has a strength like a zeolite, but then they're still visible? So that I can have a bigger molecule diffuse in, and that's what we showed in this particular case. Again, using the same synthetic process that I showed you for DFNS. Now we made this uh, aluminum silicate, and we showed that one can do a range of different reactions, including the best plastic. Right, with that, I'd like to conclude. I showed you uh, the concept of plasmonic catalyst, the black gold, and I showed you that black gold, although uh, have this lots of solar photon, the, the lifetime in those uh, lifetime of the electrons was poor. So we created these antenna reactor system where black gold acts as antenna, take all the photon, give it to the reactor, which is nickel, and, and it gives you a, a, a very good CO2 uh, conversion. And that's where the term post plasmon came in, because nickel is not plasmonic. In, in a visible range and that particular particle size, but now you're forcing them to behave like a plasma because of the black gold and the electric field around it. We carried out a range of reactions, including the magnetic isotopy effect, to prove that the reactions were due to the hot electrons are not really a heat, but obviously one cannot ignore the complete role of a heat. There is some part, but mainly it is the hot electrons. And we also give you the molecular picture of how CO2 was uh, converted into CO. Uh, via direct dissociation using the institute of studies. And there are some unanswered questions. With that, I'd like to thank my group uh, and my institute. Uh, our funding comes from Department of Atomic Energy, uh, most of that, and we also have some funding from, from, from Jay Industries. And I have lots of collaboration, and in this case, Professor Jassi Tusa for the uh, uh, these second for people to understand the electron transfer from that. With that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, uh, for such a wonderful talk. Um, okay, two things. Um, of course, the talk is now open for discussion. And the second thing is that uh, the people who are participating online could keep their uh, questions posted uh, in the chat box. I think, yeah? So once you have your questions, please put in your put in the chat box and then we will read it out for you. Thank you. So the talk is open for discussion. Thank you, Professor. And really, really proud of So, thank you, Professor, for such a wonderful talk. Throughout the talk, I couldn't take my eyes off, honestly. I don't work in material chemistry, background. I generally work in biophysical chemistry, but it was really interesting for me. So, I have two short questions. First is, Maybe I missed when you mentioned or something. So is that catalyst is feasible to work in solution form? Yes, you can. So most of the organic reactions, we do it in a solution phase. CO reduction, we do it in a gas phase. Uh, okay. And another question is uh, regarding the temperature, when you were discussing like, okay, the temperature of the catalyst is not involved, but the plasmonic electron, the hot electron okay. by illumination, like photocatalytic. So that means that this catalyst can even work at any ambient temperature, like low temperatures or the higher temperature. 
is it that any temperature specific range in which this catalyst is stable or something like that? This is stable up to say 600 degrees Celsius. Above that, some of them will start, you know, sintering. But other than that, I think any reaction can be can be tried. Okay, and when you go to the lower side? Lower, it depends on which reaction you want. The catalyst is stable, but okay. the, whether it is active or not based, will be depend on which reaction you are planning to do, right? So uh, we haven't explored much, right? There, there are lots of possibilities, but it's possible. Actually, I had this question in my mind because I generally work on hydrogen axis. Uh -huh. This is also kind of very hot fuel, in clean fuel, and sustainable energy and saving the environment and stuff. Yeah. So when I saw your catalyst, actually, I don't really work with the catalyst and margin. I totally work on the metal enzymes, which have like nickel, iron, ectocytes, and stuff. But mm -hmm. I do have lab members who work with collaboration with people who provide us like materials, like nanoparticles, and they do this kind of finding kind of reaction where uh, the enzymes activities kind of increase because you know like the metal enzymes which are available in nature, although they do all these things very efficiently, but the uh, how you say activity is kind of low. We mm -hmm. cannot do the large scale or industrial scale production or something like that. And there's like worldwide research going on to make those things feasible for a large scale. So I was just thinking also when you mentioned that this requires energy of like five or six sun, but you are planning to work in that direction to make it like one sun or something. And I know like there are hydrogenases who are photocatalytically active. So I was just thinking, just this is a quick comment and just an idea. Maybe it is rubbish or I don't know. Just I think it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. So you are saying that can we so this maybe, activity of Yeah, design. maybe when you reach that, so we okay. can maybe combine these nanoparticles with those photocatalytically active enzymes because they already contain nickel and iron activities. So maybe it can like merge and give us a better way of clean fuel production, hydrogen splitting, which is still a dream for all science community. Yes. It was just a thought which came to my mind. I just wanted to share. Thank you. And thank you so much for this excellent work. I'm really, really impressed. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you for it's a very nice talk. I have a question. Often, like um, semiconductors are used to increase the light travel of like the plasmonic or electrons. Can you briefly explain what's the advantage of the little nanoparticles compared to like semiconductor materials like iron dioxide, which are often used? Yeah, so see, one of the difference between the semiconductor based photocatalyst versus the uh, <coughs> plasmonic semiconductor is more like a Direct electronic circuits. And you bang that up, you put in the photon, and you get to it. Here is completely different. This, this is not a direct electronic citation. Right here, you are you know, collecting lots of photon, and that entire energy is then tapped into the particle. And then you get electrons have a very high energy, right? Uh, so it's independent of the, the wavelength of the light at one particular point, right? So so that's the that's the difference, right? That's and that allows you to then have the electron at a different energy levels above the energy. Like in semiconductor, you are fixed with your connection band or wireless band, and that's the energy. Here it is not, right? I can play with the energy of the electron and I can then inject it based on my reaction. So that's the that's the question you asked. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Sorry, I turned the because I had the same question because I, I saw some studies that actually should. Sorry, dude, the meeting. Sorry, a nice talk, by the way. Very, I enjoyed it very much. I had a pretty similar question because uh, you're using a uh, silicon. Dioxide, and I saw some studies where they actually showed that this anger could increase actually the harvest efficiency of those photocatalysts. So, my question was why you took actual acidic or not semiconductors or titanium materials? No, no, so there is a confusion. So, silica is ideally in the black hole case, silica is doing ideally nothing, it's only acting as a support, right, to, to create this black hole structure. How do you how do you create a network of black hole with a the tunable distance in between that, right? It's not possible with any other support. I can take a thin film and I can load it, but then it has a poor surface area and it will not be a good catalyst. I cannot sure. take a mob or anything. So that's where the, uh, the silica part comes in. The electron separation is not coming from the silica, it's coming from the, the gold and nickel. Yeah, yeah. I also know. Um, my, my question was like him because 
there is some studies that show that Fritania can actually increase uh, the harvest efficiency of those hot electrodes if you use it. Well, I think it's possible. Like, see, any any material which has the ability to take the electron can be used, right? It can be titanium, it can be zinc oxide, any semiconductor, quantum dots. Uh, people are done it. We also tried that for some some other application. The reason why cho we chose nickel is because see, a, this is a the catalysis is a very as you know, right? Very complicated thing. You want to have the put on, you want to generate the electron, you want to transfer the electron to the CO2. At the same time, you also want the CO2 to sit on to the active site where the electron is generated. And we knew that nickel is a good in terms of, you know, yeah. can we sorting the CO2. That's why we use the nickel. I think, I think we can use also other metals we're trying to explore that part. So that's the reason why we use nickel rather than semiconductor. And then, in addition, maybe, um, about the lifetime of the catalyst, you mentioned the sintering process is a problem. Um, how stable is it? Because you said up to 600, but below, how long does it take until the sintering is actually? So in photocatalysis, no sintering occurs, right? We tie it up to 100 hours, and it's, because it's at a very low temperature. That's the advantage of using the cross mine. And you, since you're not heating it, they will never go under sintering. In a high temperature, the, I showed you, I have quickly showed you this uh, uh, TiO2 copper. They also be tied up to 200 hours. There was no sintering. Again, because the defect played the role, and defect uh, is, we use it is a concept of SNSI, strong metal support interaction. Yes. So now here that SNSI is tuned by the defects. So defects allow the very strong interaction of the support with the with the copper, and that allows you to you to stop the uh, stop the century. In fact, last week I was in Zurich just to see the exactly same thing. Can I really see whether the particles are really centering or not? And they have this in situ T where you get heat. So we heat it up to 650 degrees Celsius, and nothing was moving, which was which is abnormal as such, right? Yes. 650, they should move and form a big particle, but uh, they won't. So again, the concept of the uh, defect uh, plays a role. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very nice talk. Everyone said inspiring, it's really mind-blowing. Uh, in the first part of the talk, you showed that you form CO, right? It's a perfect syngas generator, yes. in my understanding, yeah. right? And this is the problem which all the companies who are trying to form e fuels have. They do not have a safe gas generator, right? Yeah. They know Fisher crops, they know methanol synthesis, they know higher alcohols, amazing 100 years of knowledge, but not this, right? This is a 70% capex of the planet. So, in your understanding, this is also equilibrium limited, right? What is really, you show the rates, it's very high, right? But what is really the percentage that you are able to achieve at room temperatures with this current uh, or conversions? Room temperature, nothing happened. Uh, sorry, 250 degrees. Yeah. In sort of conversion, so I don't remember the exact number, but this could be. I think, this is low pressure, it's atmospheric, atmospheric pressure, pressure, right? I think uh, around 20%. 20%. And if you like, uh, let's say if I pressurize the system and then I will shift my J sharp pair principle, right? And then this will be like a perfect miniaturized sink as generator, right? Yeah. It's money. That's what we're trying. Yeah. That's doing the uh, light uh, reaction in pressure, it needs a very unique uh, reactor system. That's what we're trying yeah. to achieve. But yes, that's where we are also going, right? This CO2 to CO, once you like <coughs> this, I think the problem is I didn't solve because the rest yeah. of the thing is already known. Yes, the rest yeah. of the thing is already known. Very nice work. And, and with this defect thing that you showed in the second part, you said strong metal support interaction. And I've seen some reports coming where people are talking about how do we react to the effects of the science and what is this and so on. Uh, is it an electronic kind of interaction or is it just like uh, some kind of uh, uh, strong metal support interaction with what we call it in general? Terms? It's the electronic uh, interactions, but I think we need to go still a little bit deeper and understand how, the, how these defects are really you know, uh, connecting with active sites. I think the XAS and other techniques will allow us to understand that. But it has to be uh, electronic interaction. They are very strong, right? So a simple, uh, simple physics option or something like that will not allow them to be stable and not under the same. Thank you so much. Uh, very nice talk, Professor. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you said in plasmonics, you have to put a particular wavelength to get it excited, right? So if you give more energy, will it be excited? Hmm. Yeah, it's 
It's, it's not about the energy, it's about the uh, no, like uh, uh, surface, uh, what is it called? LSPR. So, resonance means you have to have the two frequencies match each other exactly. to get the resonance, right? Yeah. So, yeah. if your uh, upcoming frequency doesn't match with the electron uh, that cloud frequency, there will be no resonance. That's what I started with. So, yes. that, that is true for uh, if the particles are 10 nanometer or 20 nanometer. Fixed size. Okay. Whereas in black gold, that's an advantage. You now have this coupling. So in addition to the size effect, now the coupling also decides at what wavelength they, they will undergo. It's like a so what is the resonance? You have electron cloud oscillating into the natural frequency, and then your wavelength of light is coming and there there are the resonance. But now I have two electron, their cloud, there is and then they are also coupling. So this natural oscillation frequency will also be different, right? And that allow and then how many of them are coupling? That allows you to then have a different wave. Otherwise, even you put a higher energy, it will not undergo resonance, right? If it is only one single time. And one more thing, uh, let's say uh, if your absorption is more than IR, so your band gap will be very low, right? So here the concept of band gap doesn't arise, right? It's more like the but electrons will uh, slowly uh, come down from the upper X register to lower X register. Yes, right? above Fermi level. So how much to the UV band? According to the EU band, uh, I'm not getting it. Uh, no, I, my question was that methane selectivity is uh -huh. it because of the absorption? Means is it going for the IR range that lower uh, energy? That's why methane is actually lower potential. CO2 to methane potential is low compared to CO. Uh -huh. Minus 0.53 to 0 0.4. Based on the, that's what you are correcting is this semiconducting electron energy level and then the electron injection right into the yes. CO2 and but the, ultimately it's coming down from the uh, let's say gold to nickel so nickel thermal energy right yes. so there is potential involved yeah, yeah yeah so is that potential determining the methane selectivity compared to CO2 it's a very good point we never see a change in the selectivity whether you so we did this uh, weather dependent study at a different wavelength even including the IR if you see the rate increases because uh, absorption <coughs> in that region is weak as compared to the visible, but we haven't seen the, the selectivity uh, change. One of the reasons is the way the mechanism is, it's the CO2 converts into CO directly, right? N not going through some intermediates like you said. And then if CO stays there, it will get another molecule of hydrogen, another molecule, and it will become methane. If CO doesn't stay, which is a desorption state, then you will always get a selectivity towards the CO. And in plasmonic, you create huge electric field, polarized electric field onto the surface. And we believe, we don't have an experimental proof, but that's where we are going in that direction, that this electric field is dissolving the CO, right, from the nickel. Ideally, nickel CO bonding is very strong. Most of the time, if you take any nickel catalyst, it gives you methane and not CO. Here, it's just opposite. And the reason is, the opposite reason is, this electric field is dissolving the CO from the nickel. And that's why if it is not staying there, if the residence time is low, they will not form the nickel. Thank you. Wonderful. So, you mentioned your palladium, uh, palladium into some catalyst when you pass oxygen on here. This lithium is oxidized. Uh -huh. so I believe palladium, palladium also oxidized. No, it's a PT and okay. So, is it a chance that palladium also oxidized? Yes, ideally, yes, right? Because it's the same condition, but palladium doesn't. And the reason is look at the structure, it's PT is doped into the and PT is inside, and we have lots of rhodium particles, rhodium atoms around the PT inside. I can show you the structure, but imagine this as a uh, dope. No, it's not a quotient. It's a dope nanoparticle. We have rhodium, and some of the atom is by PT. That's the, the Japanese beta. It's a very unique uh, design. Somehow PT remains as a PT zero. We did that study. We did XPS, XAS. So I asked the same question: that How come PT doesn't go under oxidation? But it does. Only rhodium goes. Then what is the role of PT here? If you instead of the PT are you, then take the RU oxide, which is commercially available, so then there is no role of uh, yeah. It should, it should. But see, it's not only RU if you take only RU oxide, it doesn't do the reaction. Okay. And if you only take RU PT, it doesn't, but this is another important question that we also asked by our referees. That why you need a PT then? You can just take a RU and RU oxide and RU. Then we realize we did that control experiment, that activity goes up. So somehow the presence of PT in RU PT helps you in dissociating the hydrogen. Hydrogen dissociation is the key in converting the, the acetylene into ethane, right? And then my electric field dissolves the ethane. 
uh, on the surface. It doesn't go to it. Yeah, it's, a, it's some sort of a spillover, one can say. Although it's few atoms, but yes, it could be the spillover. Any question from the audience? Okay, we have some online questions for you. Yes. Hopefully, Okay, uh, the first question is from uh, Avin. So it's about, he says, curious to know that how porous was the sample? If not, do you think porosity would have an effect on plasmonic activity? The sample was a porous because I showed you the, the DFNs. It has very unique porosity because of the, the fibrous nature. Uh, the surface area can go up to uh, 800 meters per gram. And when we loaded the black, when we loaded the gold particle onto the, the silica surface, obviously the porosity will go down, but it was still porous. I think around 300 meters per gram. So, uh, but whether the porosity of the silica has a role in, in plasmonic catalysis, something like that, I haven't, uh, we haven't studied that, right? uh, but possibly. Okay. Um, I also have a couple of questions. Uh, so you spoke about this nickel getting oxidized. When you're, when you're, let's say, exposed to atmosphere. Yeah. So this also could happen when you, when you're doing the reaction, right? When you start your gold probe with the surface of the your gold nanoparticle or nickel nanoparticle, maybe you're talking about fine nanometer surface, is oxidized and you're directly using the reaction conditions. Did you check, let's say, before catalysis and after catalysis to or Brexpears or any other methods to check whether they're already transformed in the beginning because Although it's metallic, but the surface could be non-metallic. Let's say you could, there are some oxo species on yes. the surface. It's exactly, we faced. I showed you one uh, this data. See, its activity is less, and then it increases. Right. So this indicates that when we loaded the reactor during the loading, which we did in an open air environment, gold is stable. Gold, nothing happens in general for short time. But nickel, nickel does really go to oxygen. So that's why you see now. And then, after several hours, that nickel reduces to nickel zero and you get a good activity. So we characterize the catalyst here, we characterize the catalyst here, and then we characterize the catalyst here. This is the in-situ reduction of nickel then? This is the in-situ, yeah. Right. So yeah. that's what we did, we in-situ And the second question is like, when you use this nickel, so you add a nanoparticle, uh, let's say it's a nanoparticle mixed with gold, right? Uh -huh. So what, what happens if you take, you make this, gold and make a layer of nickel on the surface, somehow by reduction, let's say chemical reduction and so on. Why do you need a particle? Because that I think if you make a layer, it's the electron injection at, from, from gold would be much easier, right? Now, to take out the electron from, from gold. Very good idea, very good. So we wanted particle uh, because the, the typical catalyst design was the nickel nanoparticle will go only between the gaps so that gold remains free to absorb the photon. If I have a thin layer of uh, nickel. But, but, but in, in hydrogen evolution for photocatalysis, people are doing that, they're using this kind of thin layer on the, on the, the surface of this part when I did and so on, yeah. where they say that this layer especially helps to take out the electron and then to, to interact with the. And this is exactly what happened. We wanted nickel nanoparticle, but if you read our paper, just to realize that it's not really a nickel nanoparticle only sitting onto the gold, but you have very thin layer, extremely thin layer of a nickel hydroxide, not a nickel. Mm -hmm. And then nickel hydroxide helps in concentrating the CO2. It also acts as a barrier for electron. Once they move from gold to nickel via tunneling, let us say, then they will not come back. So that is something we observe using the, uh, the, the TEM. So we would, I think, few lines. You don't really have a... a perfect proof of uh, saying that, but we hypothetically say that this could have been uh, also been happening in, in, in this particular case. Okay, thank you. And one more, probably the last one. At the, the beginning, you, you showed this gold nanoparticle, you really assembled them in the distance. Mm. So is there a Oswald ripening? Because you, you, you have this, let's say you start with a seed or a nucleation, and then you really uh, you know, keep a particle next to each other, I and mean, the synthetic conditions, you are doing a solution, the solution chemistry, it's easy that they can move around and you know, exactly. have a collaboration. Yeah. Uh, as well, writing is easier the case, right? So, yeah, I agree, I agree. So, so this is a cartoon. This was our dream, mm -hmm. but we never achieved that. It's just impossible, right? Because uh, it, I, don't, I don't know whether we, what's called writing is there because it's at a very low temperature, but another, another thing is, so this is the silica fibers. See, gold is here. Gold is also here, gold is also inside. 
So when you have another gold atom, these guys will get a more number of gold atoms as compared to this, as compared to this. So there's a diffusion barrier when you grow the C0 to C1 to C3. And that's why you see this is more realistic cartoon where we saw a heterogeneity in the particle yeah, size. Yeah, yeah. We attempted uh, to stop that, but it's just impossible because of the way the DFNS is, you will always have the diffusion issues. Right? Some will get faster and some will get a, a slower amount of, uh, slower in terms of getting these good atoms. I mean, last question. <laughs> yeah, then that's done. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, uh, so you start from CO2 to CO and so methane. So is it possible to go to higher C products like, I don't know, methanol or even higher because is this the, the element dependent or how is it? It's element dependent also. I think people see more in many they use the copper, but also the pressure, right? Yeah. It's something that we are building now in lab. The pressure and light is something that we're still struggling yeah. to. Atmospheric pressure is easy to 10 bar, 20 bar, you will see. Yeah, yeah. But that we have a thermal catalytic reactor, but not in the light. So that's what we are building right now. Especially okay. for this uh, cartoon problem, I went to guess this information. Because uh -huh. we can okay. plant nanoparticles with the <laughs> okay, um, any more questions? I don't see any questions because we are also oh, online. There's one more question online. Great. Okay, um, a message from a question from Sanjay. So it's really nice, informative talk. Uh, and he says, I'm interested to know the effect of substrate for nanoparticles such as gold or gold weaken, as you have used for silicon dioxide or titanium dioxide. By considering the fact that this material generally contain absorbed oxygen at the surface when air flow is there, which contributes uh, to the reaction. Also, if the substrate used is replaced with graphene nanosheets having a similar specific area, what happens? Any comments? Now we haven't tried the graphene. I think any substrate which allows you to tune the gaps between the particles should work, right? Because the substrate itself is not really participating in the reaction. It's always the, the plasmonic coupling. For giving the uh, broadband light absorption. So, ideally, any substrate should work uh, if you can tune these types of gas fitting particles. Okay, so I think there are not, yeah, no more questions. So, best thank the speaker. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Yeah, so if you have just come to Professor Vivek Koshetwa, be here, interact with him, coffee and Snacks is being provided. And of course, we have to thank Catlab for doing this. <laughs>